Hello again and welcome to our latest video here on the YouTubes. My name is Jay Tate. I am publisher of AuburnSports.com and I thank you for taking a look at our video today in which we are going to be discussing Gus Malzahn in a reasonable and rational manner. I know some people would think, I don't even know, JG, if we can have this conversation because nothing about Gus Malzahn in the Auburn world these days is reasonable or rational, but we're going to try to do that right now. Uh, first thing, I want to thank you for watching. As I said already, if you like what we're doing here on the channel, be sure and subscribe. It doesn't cost you any money. Just click that red button for the subscription. It would mean a lot to me. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. And if you have any comments about it, put it down below. I uh, keep a pretty close eye on what's going on on our YouTube page, and I'd be happy to interact with you and answer any questions you have. All right, let's start off with Malzahn's bio. I'll put it over here on the left. Just kind of a look at his uh, general work here at Auburn. Started off unnaturally strong uh, in 2013, got all the way to Pasadena, lost to Florida State late. Great year, unbelievable expectations, super high. Kind of slips a little bit going into 15, pops up a little bit with that great year in 2017. Now it's like he's sliding back a little bit. Um, to me, this is kind of the way things go at Auburn and has since Die was here. Other people think it should be higher. I think there's part of the Saban effect is in play there. Orgeron is finally taking a step forward. I think Auburn people feel anxiety over the fact that it seems like they're sliding behind LSU now, and they just lost to Georgia, and they're consistently behind Alabama as well. So there's some thought on that. But Auburn, through its successful period, and I'm going to call that since Dye was hired in 80, has kind of gone up and down a little bit. It's just been that way. Anyway, I'll leave that over there for you to consider as we move along. Let's take a look at some of the downsides of Gus Malzahn. There's people out there, I'm sure some of you are watching, are like, man, Gus needs to go. He's terrible for Auburn. There's also people who say, I like Gus. You guys are overrating the mistakes that he's made. Bo Nix looks awesome. He made a great hire in Kevin Steele. That defense has been awesome. Like Gus is doing a pretty good job. Let's kind of argue both sides of that. Let's start with the downside. Here are some things that the people who are mad at Gus, who don't like Gus, this is how they feel. He's 6-15 and 15 against what I call the benchmark schools for Auburn. Alabama, LSU, Georgia. 6-15 and 15 is not a good record against these teams. That includes one post-game, uh, post-season, uh, post I should say, game against Georgia in 2017 that he lost in Atlanta because carry-on broke down. But anyway, 6-15, and 15, not good. Really, really not good. Uh, but in my opinion, the last major road win would have been at Ole Miss in 2014. The Rebels were ranked number seven at that time. That was kind of as Hugh Freeze was, was hitting his peak there at Ole Miss, and that was a big win. If you remember, that was a late one, too. Um, won that one late. But it was a really good game. Really, really good game. I have not seen many road wins since then. Now, you would argue, well, they beat a ranked team on the road early this year, J.G. That's true. Uh, they won at Texas A&M, uh, who was ranked number 17 at the time. I don't know of anybody that thinks that's a big road win. It's certainly to Gus's credit that he won it, but I don't think that's a huge road win. Uh, so the Ole Miss game in 14, to me, is the last big one. Also, you could say, hey, they beat Oregon earlier this year, J.G. Oregon's good. Yeah, that's true. The game was played in Dallas, neutral site game. He also beat Washington last year, neutral site game in Atlanta. If you're going to be a, an alpha in the SEC, you've got to win some big games on the road. And Gus hasn't done that. Aside from that Ole Miss win, I mean, the, you'd have to go back to the 13th season when they beat Manziel at A&M, another great game. And I think that, that win catapulted Auburn that year. But if you're looking to hang your hat on Gus winning road games in the SEC, <laughs> that hat has fallen on the floor. The offense is what I term their SEC mediocre. Look, man, this is just me talking, but I am in the scoreboard business. I think if the offense is working, it's scoring points. So I don't want to hear about yards and efficiency and yards per play or whatever. I'm talking about points. Auburn currently sits sixth among SEC teams in scoring this year. They were eighth last year. They were fourth in 2017. They were sixth the year before that, and they were eighth in 2015. To me, that is the definition of a mediocre SEC offense. That's not to say that there aren't good things going on. He doesn't call some really good plays. He does more this year than last year, for sure. But when you're looking at scoring, 
It just hasn't been there. And he's the guy that they're paying to be the head coach, and everybody knows his calling card is scoring. His contract issue, we're going to be talking about this a little bit more later in the show, but he signed a deal in December of 2017 whereby he makes approximately $7 million a year. It's a $49 million contract over seven. And he has a buyout clause where he is owed 75% of the remaining value of the contract at any time. So if they fire him today, they owe him 75% of what they still owe him on the contract, which at this point would be about between 26 and $27 million. Last year was more like, you know, low 30s. It's a lot of money, and it affects things. I think the contract bugs people more than Gus bugs people, if that makes sense. Because they're so infuriated that they feel stuck with a guy who's not winning the big games. If that buyout was more like five million or ten million, it wasn't such an albatross. I just wonder if anxieties would be eased a little bit on that. A uh, lack of charm. A lot of people say, I don't care, just win football games. I get it. And when he was winning a lot of football games, nobody cared about his lack of charm. But at this point, He's a solid but unspe- unspectacular coach, and he doesn't have that persona that makes people love him. He just doesn't have a lot of endearing qualities person to person. Now, I kind of know him better than your average Joe, so to speak, just because I've worked with him so long, and I happen to like Gus a lot. He's a good dude, and he is funny, and he has a sense of humor, but for whatever reason, when he gets behind a podium... He feels like he's got to be stern. like, And I think part of it goes back to the contract. I'm making so much money, I've got to be Mr. Stern leader. And I can't show any humor. Whatever. Bruce Pearl heightens the expectations for this team. Absolutely. They got to the final four last year. In my opinion, they beat Virginia. They got screwed by a non-double dribble call. Should have won that game. Should have played for a national championship and probably would have won that game. But anyway, they got to the Final Four. The team got insanely hot. Bruce Pearl is a tremendous coach, and Bruce Pearl is also a great showman. He's a very interesting character. He's a great marketer. He's a great carnival barker. He's a ringleader at the circus. Everybody loves Bruce Pearl. Everybody thinks that, hey, if basketball, which was absolutely awful here six years ago, If Bruce Pearl can come in here and take that god-awful program and turn it into a Final Four, and by the way, the team is really dirty this year too, and they're recruiting at an insanely high level. Gus can't even get us to to Atlanta? I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying Bruce's success has definitely affected the way people think about football because they're like, football should be our bell cow, and it's not, and it's pathetic. And also Pearl's personality. He's just so loved. And then you look at Gus and you don't see it. The last one here is for people that really pay attention to the team really closely. I don't think neutral observers really care. But uh, development issues at quarterback and offensive line, man, outside of Nick Marshall. And Gus deserves a lot of credit on Nick Marshall. And I also want to say about Nick Marshall, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I think people who don't even remember him now are going to look back and say, damn, that guy was really good. Nick Marshall was insanely good. I don't think he gets appreciated the way that he should. Anyway, aside from Nick, I don't know as though he's had a quarterback, Gus, that he has gone out, handpicked, developed himself, and made a better player. Jarrett Stidham regressed at Auburn. And before that, it was kind of messy. I mean, Sean White was not a very good player. Now, he's got Bo Nix now, and I happen to think Bo Nix is going to be an absolute stud. He's just super young, and you can see him getting better in tangible ways. He managed the Georgia game a whole lot better than he did the Florida game and the LSU game. He missed the throw at the end, but Bo Nix is really good. There's some people that say if his name was Bo Smith and his dad was an iron worker, he wouldn't even be at Auburn. His dad's Patrick Nix. He played quarterback at Auburn, as you see every time you watch a CBS broadcast with Auburn on it. I don't really care about that. Bo Nix is at Auburn. He's playing for Gus. He's getting a lot better. Maybe that's the end of the line. Maybe Gus is actually going to develop a quarterback right here. But in the past, he has an offensive line. There aren't many Auburn guys, linemen, in the NFL. I mean, Greg Robinson starting for the Browns. He was the number two overall pick in 2013 or 14 draft, I guess. 
Braden Smith starts for the Colts at right tackle. That's two guys. Not putting a lot of guys in the NFL from that position. Those are the real shots at Gus. Really, I think it comes down to a contract and 6-15. and 15. It doesn't look good. The upside, the positive things, the happy vibes. Things about Gus that people like. Recruiting remains strong. Now, I kind of felt that way. I actually texted our recruiting expert, Jeffrey Lee, last night and spoke with him about recruiting. And before I told him what I was, why I was asking him this, I said, is Auburn recruiting better than usual, on par with usual, or worse than usual? And he said, I think it's on par, maybe a half a click better than usual, but on, on par. Now, Auburn, in general, according to the rivals' rankings, is usually a team that finishes in the 5 to 15 range in the country. Good enough, in my estimation. I think they're going to end up with a class that's in that 10 range this year. So it's not like recruiting is falling off. They're doing a pretty good job, doing a real good job. Not doing an elite job, but doing a real good job, and that's what they've been doing. No fall off there. Uh, his winning percentage is on par with the good past AU coaches. I've got the numbers right here. His winning percentage right now, he's 60-30. and 30. As Auburn's head coach right now, that's a winning percentage of, you know, whatever, 66.7%. Tuberville was 68%, and I did the math on this. You're welcome. Uh, he needed to switch two wins for losses to get even with Tuberville. So, Gus is 60-30. and 30. If he was 62-28, and 28, he'd be even with Tuberville. So, it's two wins. For Die, who's a 71% winner, it would be four wins. So Gus would need to be 64 and 26. Four wins difference between Gus and Pat Dye. Although, to be fair, those four wins <laughs> they make a big difference. But it seems like sometimes when I think about it, I think, you know, Gus really couldn't hold Pat Dye's jock. And then when you look at it and you think it's a four-win difference, it's not that big. And then Tuberville is two-win difference. So he's basically on par with the guys we've had before at Auburn. And he's doing kind of an Auburn-level job, aside from losing the big games. Competitive against a tough schedule. Look, this, the schedule this year is absolutely mind-melting. Uh, you open with Oregon, who was ranked high at the time and has continued to play at a high level. Uh, they're a good team. And then you got at Florida, at LSU. You've got Georgia at home. You've got Alabama at home. All very, very good teams. Uh, Alabama, maybe not so much now that their quarterback's out, but... The, He's gone, but they still won, and they're still considered elite, and we'll just have to see what happens in the Iron Bowl, but it's going to be a big game. It has been a really tough schedule, and they have hung in there. They beat Oregon. Uh, they lost at Florida, but that was a very tight game, and I think Bo's mistakes really hurt him in that game. Uh, the LSU game, they just played hard and lost. I don't know what else to tell you on that one. Uh, the Georgia game, that is a complicated one right there. I feel like Anyone can look at that game and come up with their own conclusion about, well, they were getting their butt kicked until Georgia let off the gas. They showed a lot of heart late making that rally. How in the world can they go three quarters at home and not score any points because it was 21 nothing going into the fourth quarter? That's a choose-your-own-adventure situation there, but they have, com they have competed. And this idea that the team's not fighting for Gus is just bullshit. Like, they are fighting. His team's playing hard. They've been engaged. In the games they've lost, they've been in and they fought. Occasionally beat Saban. Look, there's no, hardly nobody that beats Saban with any kind of regularity. Uh, Gus at this point has two wins over Saban, uh, and he is at least an even money shot to get a third one here uh, in a couple weeks. Not trying to draw any conclusions about what's going to happen there before it's played, but he's got a shot, and he's had some success against Saban, period, and not many people do. He's had zero NCAA entanglements. Look, man, they don't. They don't get into trouble. And there's people that would say, well, maybe they do need to get into some trouble and up their recruiting a little bit. But I don't know. To me, that's just kind of message board talk. In real life, you want to recruit well and not get into trouble. You want to do things the right way-ish. Because I believe it, guys. Everybody's cheating. I don't care if you're Vanderbilt or not. Everybody's cheating some. You just don't want to be an outlier. And Auburn's not. and hasn't been with football recruiting. And I mentioned earlier the teams uh, show determination. The team's still fighting. I've heard people describe this as a dumpster fire. Dumpster fires 
one of the first things you notice in a dumpster fire is the team quits. The team stops playing with the same fervor. The way that Arkansas is playing now, that's a dumpster fire. And it was three weeks ago. It's not happening at Auburn right now. And also, Gus is still a good play caller. I have been surprised, honestly. And I was skeptical of his play calling. I told him to his face. I didn't know if he still had it. And I thought the play calling has been really good this year. It's been smart. And he has adapted as the season's gone on. Dude, they threw 50 passes against Georgia. Because finally, Gus realized in his head that his run game wasn't going to get it done against Georgia. He assumed that. I mean, he thought that was going to happen. He tried it. Didn't work. And so he went to a different plan. And ultimately, it yielded some pretty impressive results. Late. You say, well, Georgia was playing zone and chilling out. Yeah, for the first touchdown, you're right. The second touchdown, they were pissed. And the third, what could have been a third touchdown drive, Georgia was panicked. I think the play calling has been really good, and I think Gus has really shown a lot of people, quieted some people, me included, that he can still do it on the play calling front. They've been good this year. So he's still got it as far as that goes. The next thing I want to talk about are the dynamics of getting rid of Gus Malzahn. This stuff is not easy to do, regardless of who it is. If the team's like, if the team quits and it's flatline at Arkansas, it's easy. You say, dude, it's over. But that's not what's going on at Auburn. And so I want to kind of explain for people how you would even fire Gus if you were doing it. Taking a look at the way it worked in 2018. So this was a situation. I wrote about it a lot last year. Gus barely got out last year. They almost fired him. There was a group here, and I try to draw these to scale these boxes. You had a group of anti-Gus observers, people that just thought he was trash and wanted to get rid of him, that he was just bad for Auburn. He was taking the program in a bad direction. On the other side, you had the anti-buyout observers. I wouldn't necessarily describe them as pro-Gus. I just think they were anti-buyout. They just thought the money was too much to get rid of a guy who hadn't flatlined, which is a reasonable opinion. And then you had Stephen Leith, who was super anti-buyout because he was the one who at least publicly took credit for that big-ass contract. He made it look like he single-handedly negotiated it and signed it in December of 2017 to save Auburn from Malzahn leaving for Arkansas. So he didn't want to pay that buyout because he was already on thin ice uh, job-wise, and he definitely could not have survived having to pay out $34 million or whatever it was for Gus. So he was really against that. And at the bottom there, you can see below like the little break, the neutral observers. There's a lot of people on the board of trustees who they, they, they watch the games, they care, they like Auburn, they love Auburn, they know Bo Nix. I mean, they know who these people are. But they're just not like in a position, or they weren't last year, where they were like, yeah, I think it's worth, you know, a 45 or $50 million investment to get rid of Gus and give somebody else a shot. Like they just weren't moved. These are people who think in financial terms to some degree, and they're like, that's a bad risk. That's a lot of money to lay out for somebody we don't know is going to be better because the guy we got right now is not trash. So that's the situations that happened last year. To me, it was almost a wash. I thought the anti-Gus observers were going to get it, but they didn't at the last minute. Leith just basically stood in and said, I, this is not happening. Fast forward to this fall. Now we're looking at 2019. You've got the pro-Gus slash anti-buyout people. On the left there, you can see I put Leith RIP. Leith got fired in the summertime. Um, and, and make no mistake about it, he is a college administrator, or was, but that contract with Gus, that <laughs> really, really hurt his Q score, so to speak. So he's gone now. But the pro-Gus slash anti-buyout group is a little bigger than it was before. I think it's just kind of like, I don't understand the people who want to get rid of Gus. I don't understand what they want to do that's better. So you got them on one side. The anti-Gus observers, to me, are a little smaller than they were a year ago. Um, there's still some people in there that really hate Gus and want to see him gone yesterday. But I think some of those people have fleed to the neutral group of people who, again, they're not really pro or anti-Gus. They're just looking at it and saying, okay, at this point it's going to be a $40 million layout to get somebody, and we don't know who yet, that may be better than Gus or may not be better than Gus. There are people that think that Kevin Steele should get the job, and I think a, a neutral observer would say, okay, here's a guy who's 62 years old, who hasn't been a head coach since 1993. He's been a tremendous coordinator at Auburn. He's been, a, in my opinion, a program saver, but 
what what's he going to do as a head coach? We don't know. Is it worth a $40 million layout? I don't know. I don't think so. I can see that argument. Another thing I didn't really include on this picture is Alan Green. You know, last year he was kind of the new kid on the block and was just learning his way. He didn't really know what to say, how to talk to these folks. He didn't know them right. He didn't really know their personalities or kind of how to assuage folks. That's a year later. He's talked to these people a bunch more. He's he's gotten out in the community. And I think he's he's on he understands his role a lot better. And he is a guy who works behind the scenes quietly. I don't think he's one of these ADs that calls the shots on everything, particularly a football coach hiring or firing. He's got to do it in collaboration with other people. But I think he is a consensus builder. And I think he's the guy who kind of walks around to people and says, okay, this is the anti-Gus people. If you want to fire Gus, I get it. He's lost. He's 6-15 and 15 in these big games. He doesn't win on the road very much. Fair points. What do you want to do now? Where do you want to get the money to pay him out? Who are you going to get? How are you going to pay that person? And tell me in three sentences why this person is a significantly better bet than Gus Malzahn right now. And he's the guy that's asking those questions. Those kinds of questions really haven't been asked in a long time. Because when Jay Jacobs was here, he was kind of there as a yes man, right? They would basically tell him what to do, and he would go, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll get up there in front of the press conference and tell him. But Allen's not really that guy. I mean, he will be if needed, but he also is a voice of reason, and I think he wants to talk about the rationale behind things that in the last couple generations at Auburn maybe haven't always been rational. Now, I told folks at AuburnSports.com, I'd say five days ago, that I didn't think Gus was going to be the head coach at Auburn next year. That really wasn't my opinion of The job Gus is doing, hey, JG, would you fire him? It's a different question. I just didn't think he was going to be the head coach at Auburn because I thought some of these neutral people would start leaking into the anti-Gus observers, and that would affect things. And also, with Leith being gone, he was such a vocal defender of Gus last year when it came down to it. With him being gone, I thought that would offer less resistance for the people that were anti-Gus. Now you've got an interim president. It's Jay Gouge. I think Jay Gouge is going to probably end up being the actual president again. And he's a guy who cares. He listens. He's involved. But he's kind of passive. I think he generally lets the board of trustees do what it wants to do about things in athletics. So I don't think he's necessarily going to be an anti-Gus or a pro-Gus guy. So I didn't expect the neutral observers group to be as big as it is now. And I just didn't think that the money would really affect him as much now that it's down another five or six million dollars to get rid of him. And also, we're not done with the season yet. He's still got Sanford this weekend. They're going to kill them. And then you got Alabama and the Iron Bowl. I think a lot of Auburn people are like, this is going to be an Iron Bowl. It's going to be all orange and blue. Alabama doesn't have two Tonga Valoa. Auburn's going to roll. It's going to be awesome. And I, I don't know if that's true. I mean, I think Auburn's got at least an even chance to win that game, if maybe not a little bit more. Because Tua Tungavailoa was such an important figure for Alabama's offense, and I didn't think... I mean, the defense at Alabama's not quite as good as it usually is. The offense, I thought, leaned a lot on Tua, who is a tremendous football player. But he's out for a while. And he's not going to play in that game. If the situation arises where Auburn doesn't win the Iron Bowl, I think this is going to flip a little bit. The anti-Gus observers are going to get bigger. The neutral observers are going to get smaller. Jay Gouge is going to continue being kind of a passive sideshow kind of dude when it comes to athletics decisions. And I think this this situation could flip a little bit. But as it stands right now, Gus is safe. I don't think he's going to get fired at Auburn. There is the possibility that he goes to Arkansas. Arkansas has missed on some targets. I know they're interested at least to some degree. If Gus wants to get out and wants to restart his clock, so to speak, i.e. get another contract at Arkansas, get the full seven years or whatever, uh, he could probably do that if he wants to. Me, my opinion, I think he would rather stay here and continue doing what he's doing because he thinks a whole lot of Bo Nix, and he thinks that kid is special right now, and he thinks Bo Nix is going to be insanely special in the coming years. He doesn't want to waste that. He doesn't want someone else to enjoy the fruits of you know, Gus's labor of getting through this season with Bo making the mistakes that he's made. 
All right, so that right there is a <laughs> reasonable and rational discussion of Gus Malzahn. I've tried to explain to you the good things about him, the bad things about him, and the machinations that come along with trying to get rid of him if they choose to do so. It's a tough ask for these neutral people to say, hey, yeah, we'll spend $40 million to give it a shot on somebody else without knowing who it is. If it's a big-name person that has done a lot of big things at other schools, maybe. But I don't know as though anyone at Auburn is even trying to promote that as a possibility right now. I don't know. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching the video. I'm sorry I went a little bit long, but, you know, it's kind of a complicated issue and a lot of people want to talk about it. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to our channel here, please do. It costs you nothing, but it makes me happy. And if you like the video, thumbs up. Any comments you guys have in the uh, comments section, I'll definitely be reading. And if you have a question for me, I'll do my best to answer it. Appreciate you guys watching. Till we see you again, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars.